So the way I see it is the same way that the church would have seen the Goths in Europe. You know, you've got all of these mad Germanic tribesmen running around. They're wild and violent and completely profane. They're barbaric. They don't speak the same tongue as everyone else. But in their minds, they still have the the spark of the innate yeah. you know, um, creative energy that God gave them. And so what did they do? They brought Gothic into the church. Hello and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits. Rabbits, well, the things that jump around on the internet, go down rabbit holes. Rabbits reproduce quickly, like a lot of ideas online. We talk about these things lightly. Try to figure out exactly what the heavy parts are in these jumping around rabbits. And then we try to talk about them lightly using theology, anthropology, history today <laughs> kilts that's right kilts kilts comes on she's a writer in australia kilts writes incredible articles often for d c r dragon common room you can find her stuff at dragoncommonroom.com it's good i highly recommend it today we talk about what it is to be a part of this thing called the vending machine culture. We are vending machine people and Kilts is here to tell us about it. Kilts, what's the, just, let's just figure out where you are and who you are. So you're in Australia, correct? I am, I am, I'm in Australia. I'm on the you're East Coast writer. of Australia. You're a freelance writer that I just read an article about you uh, that you've written called American Vending. Uh, wait, the Vending Machine People. Vending Machine People. I can't yeah. wait to talk about this. You guys, <laughs> one of the best articles. It's also nuts <laughs> and in a good way. So you, I picked this up on Gab, but you you write for something with DCR, right? Would you explain to us what what's going on with that community? Oh. Of course. So DCR is a, it's a community of writers and creatives. It stands for the Dragon Common Room. DCR was started by Professor Rachel Fulton Brown, who is a, uh, I mean, she's a bomb. Like she's a professor of medieval history at University of Chicago. Um, she has taken all of these little drakes under her wing, little baby dragons, and she's been training all of us up in, uh, the liberal arts and uh, Christian history and uh, uh, the thinking of the medieval monastics. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. Um, we found each other and kind of <laughs> had a, a beautiful chemistry. And so we've been um, collaborating on lots of projects in the last couple of years uh, while I was stuck down here during the COVID thing. Were you born and raised uh, there in Australia? I was born here, I was raised here, um, but I had a very strange kind of upbringing in Australia. So uh, uh, people that have been reading my on Telegram always hear me talk about being a cosmopolitan because it's true. I mean, I grew up around Greeks um, more than I did Anglo-Celtic Australians. And so uh, this has kind of informed my way of thinking because... Um, uh, I'm much more familiar with the ouzo drinking plate smashing Mediterraneans uh, <laughs> than I am with a lot of other parts of Australia. Um, I think you could pass. Do they, do they let you? We're going to talk about race. Do they let you pass? As yes, a we are going to talk about race, of course. Um, I do pass. Uh, in fact, the Greeks uh, and a lot of Italians that I grew up with um, used to ask me a lot where I was from because of my face and they could instantly see a little bit of Europe in it. And they were always very interested to know where I was from. So it kind of started my, how should I put it? I had to raid my heritage a little after I uh, had to keep convincing everybody that I was from here and uh, yeah, unlocked a lot of interesting doors, but um, yeah, I can, I, I pass. Uh, <laughs> I, 
yeah, we, we have a different set of racial categories in Australia. So, uh, yeah, well, I, let's I, get into I proudly time. proclaim that I am uh, with the Greeks and Italians. I am a wog. Yes. Uh, so I found you reading a couple of things. with My buddy Richard said, you got to talk to this woman. And I he said, dobbed I me in. I do need to talk to, first of all, Kilts, don't get mad. I need to talk to a woman. Almost everybody I talk to on here is a man. And I don't know yes. what that says about me. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. But that you're a woman is one thing. But these articles, guys, this, Andrew, Andrew's in Russia. Andrew, wake up. I'm awake, I'm awake. Because you got to read this stuff. So the first thing I want to talk about is this quote. <laughs> are you ready yeah no, no it's good it's good uh vending machine people are clamoring for coherency in the babble of the free market identity okay the vending machine people i think are something like new world people the stuff we do on this podcast would you agree yes what is that oh, definitely. To you? what is that to you? um well i checked out a bit of your stuff because uh uh, Richard sent me a lot of stuff like, uh, you know, when he introduced us and um, basically you talk a lot about old world versus new world. Um, so I didn't have that vocabulary, but I've been thinking about this problem for a long time um, because I grew up in a non-English speaking community in the middle of an Anglophone British colony. Um <laughs> My life didn't really make sense. So I had to figure out why this country felt so strange to me. It's always felt very, very strange to me. Australia has felt like a, a kind of social experiment from the time that I was young and growing up in it. Um, so that tipped me off, you know, the massive journey of trying to figure out why. Um, old world versus new world was just a part of my childhood. Uh, the the Greek community that immigrated to this country brought with them the entire weight of the Mediterranean. Um, and the Anglo-Celts that had been sent here to settle the, the continent just didn't have it. Uh, the culture shock was uh, unbelievably intense. And so um, it, it's it's been an interesting experience talking to Americans about your racial issues because a lot of what you discuss, which is based on skin pigmentation, right. really didn't apply here. Um, and what I saw was going on in Australia was more this incredible tension between old world and new world people. Um, I wanted to figure out why, why that existed because from an untrained eye, we all kind of look the same. You know, like if I can pass as Greek, why is it that I'm considered a different race? So it, it kind of, uh, yeah, just put me on this massive tangent. And a few continents later, I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> How did you figure it out? What happened? <sighs> How did you That's get to huge... the point where race, the categories of race in the new world, the eugenics, they're eugenics categories. I hate yes. to tell you people they're, they're, yes, they're they are. scientists did this. No offense to scientists, but they did it. <laughs> How did you figure out they weren't? Offend them. <laughs> oh, you can offend. <laughs> I offend Guys, everybody. You can offend article. scientists. <laughs> read this article. It is full of proper offenses, I think. Can I say that? Yeah. All right, let's not. Okay, hold yeah. on. We'll get there. Okay. How did it happen, though? When did it turn? Did it have something to do with faith adoption? What happened? Like, uh, Well, it depends on how much of my personal biography you want. But, I mean, everything's affected by personal biography true, because true. everything's mythology. Uh, I think mythologically. So, I mean, I have to integrate some of my own experience in this. But, uh, I mean... <laughs> I started to understand the difference between the people that were doing public processions with icons and uh, praising God in public shamelessly versus the established population of the country here. Um, what, what that looked like 
to us as outsiders. I mean, I say us as outsiders because I'm not Greek. Right. Um, my family are not Greek, not Greek, although I do have a lot of Greek family because of the, the mingling. But um, that seemed to be the most important thing. The most important thing that distinguished us was their faith. Yeah. Uh, it was the most irritating part of their presence here because uh, suddenly they'd arrived and the streets were closed off for processions yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the priest was loud and on a, on a, you know, loud speaker and you could hear it four blocks away, of the, you know, they just didn't care. Like they, they, they brought Greece with them. Um, but, uh, it, it was always, uh, exposure to the Orthodox faith, which made me sort of understand the difference. And, um, I just, I mean, I had a very Paleolithic understanding of, of the distinction between us all because I wasn't, uh, I wasn't Hellenic. Um, but I left Australia um, and started to meet people from uh, different countries, different Mediterranean countries, and, and talk to them about it. And I started to understand that there was something very wrong with the culture here, um, the way that we approached life uh, versus the old world, and everything just started to click. Uh, yeah. So the identity became, was it a type of, the things became unified or religio, they became united through this idea of the ligament because of a common understanding of telos, of purpose given by the church. And now that was the identity marker. Does that sound right to you? Because that's what happened to me. Mm. There was something like, oh, I'm more common with her. I have more in common with her because of where she goes on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Sundays than I do with him because he has straight hair and a big nose like me. It, one, one category seemed ridiculous, at some mm. point, especially after living in Africa, something like that happening with you or not really? Yeah. Very similar experience. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I've lived in Africa. I spent a few years there as well. Where did um, you live in Africa, Kilt? East Africa. I oh, was in Tanzania. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, uh, I mean, the big look, the biggest culture shock, the biggest distinction was being a child around Greek Orthodox yayas, you know, the old women. Uh, they, they had a very strong national pride. Um, and I mean, you, you, they, they carried this Greek versus Turk dichotomy with them when they arrived. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't understand it. We didn't understand why. I mean, why, why would you talk about the Turks? You're here now, right? You're in the promised land. This is, you know, the most prosperous Western economy that's ever existed in the history of the West. Be happy. Um, exactly. Be happy. It's perfect. Um, uh, and yet they would still discuss these things. So, um, you know, I would talk to them about what was going on there. Yes, it's the telos of the church, but it's also the shared experience of how they've gone through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of liturgy uh, together, the liturgical life, but it's the liturgical life uh, under uh, oppression, which I think has crystallized their identity more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, to be Greek, at least from what I can see, uh, after having grown up amongst the Hellenics here, was to be a free person, which isn't politically free, uh, even though they achieved national independence. Um, what they had really achieved was spiritual independence un under the Ottoman rule. They maintained Hellenism um, under an Islamic tyranny. So That's I think mm -hmm. for me, this was kind of the beginning of everything. Um, how do you crystallize an identity then? It's a liturgical uh, heartbeat under the oppression of uh, tyranny. And something like co-suffering, right? Yes, and, very and by the much way, so. You see, that, you see that in military, in any military, the, the unity of the soldiers is born out of their common suffering and then their brothers. But in a way that you and I, I don't know, I wasn't in the military. Maybe, 
No. You can't understand <laughs> It's one it of the all. few things I've never done. <laughs> so you've not shot anyone. This is nice to know. Not yet, although not Richard's yet. making really good progress <laughs> at being my first kill. <laughs> Richard is one of her <laughs> editors. And Rich, I, I, I met Kilts listening to Richard yell into a phone. I was like, Who, who's that over there? What's that? And then I kind of <laughs> liked it, though, because you were giving it to him. I was not nice. happy. But any, look, anyone that... <laughs> Anyone that's ever talked to me on Telegram before knows that if I'm not happy, I'm probably going to yell at you. <laughs> yes, he, he did not seem he did not seem all that bothered by it. It was hilarious. <laughs> he was kind of holding the phone like, "She'll be done in a second. It'll be over. Just just hold on with me." But yeah, it was impressive. Well, I like that kind of person. So then you write these articles, and the, the article that that really interests me for this conversation, but I think we'll do some more, is the, uh, vending machine people. And the reason why yeah. is because. That identity you just spoke of, it seems like Americans on some level in this sort of trad movement, this 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 Orthodox bro movement. It's not just Orthodox, though. It's everybody. They're grasping for something like the identity you just described. And one of the people you speak yes. about are black nationalists. Yes. What is a black nationalist doing in your mind when they're trying to cohere around something like pigmentation or some shared co-suffering maybe there what what mm -hmm. what's happening from your in your article you talk about it but what do you think's happening there? Well, well people might be wondering why you know why is this very pallid woman from australia commenting on Amer american black nationalism um i would not be orthodox if it wasn't for uh african black nationalists mm -hmm. um so i mean like, unfortunately, I can't talk about what I'm talking about without talking about myself. But uh, the Greeks did not convert me to orthodoxy. Uh, and I think this is something that I need to probably mention in this conversation, that uh, the orthodox that are looking at the old world need to understand that the old world people are not necessarily open uh, and evangelical. They've been on the defensive for so long that their mind and the mentality is set to preservation of tradition, preservation of holy tradition and national tradition. So that, that you know, you have to make the distinction between the holy tradition of the apostolic church and then the tradition of your regional uh, people. And they've been on the defensive, whereas the Afro nationalists pan-Africanists, they're on the offensive and they were the ones that found me. Um, so when I was in Tanzania and I was living there, working there, you know, partying there, doing whatever I was doing, um, you know, I started to bump into all of these people because, you know, we had a lot of really interesting, <laughs> really interesting characters that just flew into Africa all the time. A lot sure. of Americans would go there. Um, a lot of black Americans would go there because they, they saw it as a, you know, kind of repatriation to yeah. the motherland and they want to go back to the continent. And, um, and, you know, I'd bump into them and talk to them all about, you know, Malcolm X and, you know, how you ended up thinking the way you do why did you end up packing up and, and leaving and and arriving on this continent with your stuff like why why do you think that this is home you know for me it was a second home uh but you know people are going to look at me and go well how can you say that uh so i was really interested to know like why why would an american person think that that's their home like what, what has brought you back here back right what is this? What is this concept of coming back? Because most Americans, they come from the West, but still we'd see some blow into the East, the East African region. And so I started talking to them about everything. And then I was digging and I started to, uh, to look at, you know, this, this history of black nationalists in America um, and the Caribbean. Uh, you know, the history of the Gaviites, the influence of the black fascists in Harlem, uh, the Marxists that had come in and started pushing, uh, you know, pan-African uh, Marxism in, in, in the African continent um, very powerfully uh, and, you know, catastrophically in some cases. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to understand, like, what, what brought them back? Um, I lost my train of thought. No, but, no. You know, and what what brought them back is this attempt to rediscover the 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 proper purpose. 
I want to keep going to purpose because I feel like purpose unites people. But I think you're saying something also. They're looking for something. A language. Everyone wants roots. People want right. roots. They want their roots. Right? They're trying to create a language yeah. that describes how they're connected through the common suffering of being having taken off the continent or something. But it yeah. doesn't work when you go back. No, it doesn't work when you go back. Work. No, it no, work. no. As as much as, as as much as people would look at me and say you're clearly a European, that's debatable. Once you leave the boundary of your uh, your soil and you get transplanted by these machines, these imperial machines, you are very much transplanted. Uh, so, you know, like this is this beautiful thing that, you know, I was taught by all of these, uh, these guys that I was hanging out with, you know, they, they had this lovely concept of repatriation, but they had a really strong sense of what it meant to be transplanted. And as they were talking about their experience, I started to realize this has happened to us. You're, you know, they were describing the African American situation, and then they, the more they were describing it, the more I started hearing the resonance with what had happened to the uh, Celtics that had been sent down to Australia. So there was wow. a lot of uh, wow, that's overlap, and I started to think, hold on a second, am I European anymore? Like, can I go back? Uh, and knock on the door of all of these nations and say, bring me back because now there's about six nations in my blood. So who's going to take me back? And it's the same thing for the Afro-Americans. Who's going to take you back? You have, how many tribes are running through your blood? I mean, not just African tribes. You know, you look at all of the, the Indian laborers that were sent to the Caribbean, the Irish that were sent all over the place, the Scottish, the English, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on and on. It's like, who is going to take us back? We have nowhere to go. But it's, so, a, as you say in the article, we really are placards for the synthetic globalism, or you call it synthetic we incorporation. We, yeah. Our yeah. homeland is the corporation. Yikes. It is. It is. It is. Our, our country is the vending machine. It's a sad thing to admit, but I mean, <laughs> I don't see it as sad. I, you know, I have to preface this because it sounds very depressing. I sound like I'm I know, dooming you, everybody. You never struck me as depressing on no. any conversation. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I wear a lot of black, but I'm not depressing. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we, we do. We look, our nativity is in a vending machine. I mean, wow. What do you, what do you do? You talk to old world people that have roots in a country and a nation and a language and an ethnicity and a liturgical practice, a religion, you know, some spirituality. We're incomparable. Like, how do you relate to those people? So, I mean, I had to do it multiple times and then I had to come back to here and integrating it's been kind of a wild ride. It's been really, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> People reject you. You get canceled. I don't know if it's canceled's a word. I just don't make sense to a lot of people. It's I weird. mean, I like, do you part. make sense to people? No. Like, but this they is don't the thing. reject it out of hand. They don't reject you out of hand, right? They're like, something doesn't fit here. This writer mm. doesn't fit, but she's not crazy. Does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think everyone thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> I didn't. Now, I you think you rare. scared me when you said you're going to say the F word a lot, which is kind of fun. I say that, too. I can control it. I just really like profanity. People have tried to convince me to give it up. And I just I'm a poet. I can't give up words. I tell everyone Sometimes I need all the, the words. Right word. Yes, you need all the words. It is. I need all the words. So the vending machine people keep going with this. So so then you say we have flags. I like this. We have, we have flags, but we have no idea where we're from. So what, what are you doing to not be a member of the synthetic incorporated nation? What can you do? Like, is it a, is it a thing? Is there, is there a path? I mean, you're going to, I'm leading you back to orthodoxy, which I don't really want to. What I want to say is, is what do you say in mixed company to people about this synthetic incorporation? Do have you given up on mixed company? What do you do? Define mixed company. Mixed company is, is for me, it's really good reggae music with seven, I don't know, 
Rasta leaning thinkers and five guys who are five women or five, whoever who know about orthodoxy and then 10 people who are there for the music. And then 20 people who were all standing together and we're trying to figure out life and they're secular. And then there's two scientists in there. Okay. What do you do? <laughs> that no one wants in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really good question. I what is it, what happens in that room if you can hear yourself over the music? What happens? Like, do you care to bring any of this up? Yeah, I mean, I put my foot in it all the time. <laughs> but like, all right. So like, there's two ways of coping with this. First is to deny it, which is a terrible way of coping with anything. I don't like denial. I think it's just bullshit. The second way is just rip it open and talk about it all the time, which means you're isolated, of course. I mean, inevitably, um, just because you're highlighting things that people don't want to look at yet. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I spend a lot of time with foreigners. You can hear it in the way I speak. My, my, my accent's very messed up. I'm not very typically Australian sounding. Um, I've really become very, very cosmopolitan after realizing this. And that's mostly just because now I realize like, I, I don't like the machine that was built here, right. but I have a very strong spiritual connection to the soil in this country. I mean, this is my land. It is my land. I belong here. Right. Um, I come from the soil in this country, but the machine I don't come from. So now I have to reconcile those two things. How do I create a uh, an ethnos that is outside of the machine, but it's connected to the soil of this continent? Um, what do you think of I'm this Rod Dreher it out. idea? What do you think of this this Rod Dreher idea of you know creating isolated communities and moving away from machine communities? Is that is that a mm. thing for you? No, no, I don't think it's I don't think it's practical. I don't like it. I mean, you're on the internet. I'm on the internet. Like we're not running, right? I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Why? know what it would look like. <laughs> I don't know how, for me how it would. My wife can run though. She she would do it. She we're still she talking. Would do it? Yeah, she's still talking about going to the monastery when we get a little bit older. And I don't mind that idea, but it is similar in nature, right? The idea of commu creating a community away from those people. It's not in my blood. I have I mean, an idea. Yeah, you triggered the, the thought. All right, so. The monasteries themselves are going to create the nation. Hmm. That's what you talk about in the article, which I highly recommend everybody. <laughs> in the sense that Elizabeth and the English destroyed the monasteries and in some way destroyed yes. English, they are, their identities. You're saying the, mona the monasteries of new will recreate the nation. Interesting. Yeah, there will be the restoration of nationality to the British peoples. And I, when I say British peoples, I don't just mean like obviously racially British because anyone who's been absorbed into this Anglophone Anglosphere machinery, you're, you're now part of it. Like everyone's been transplanted. Right. Um, uh, so, I mean, the Elizabethans, they, they torched their country. They ripped the heart out of England when they took the monasteries away from, from everybody. And so, I mean, it depends on how much you want to get in, into orthodoxy, but uh, no, oh, the, the, it's all good. The way I see it is that the the same thing that happened for the Greeks. It was the church that kept them united and coherent. It, it kept the Greek uh, soul yeah. coherent in that madness, and that was because they had their monks, they had their monasticism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. I can't run away from the machine, but I can tap into the monasticism that is wow. here. That's right. Uh, and then maybe we start something new. I don't know. But that thinking follows kilt because for a Christianity without the monastic tradition to tap out of the machine is to tap into what? Mm. I, I think as, as we discussed in a, uh, the, the, our text machine, Ang to be Anglican is to be modern, is to be the machinery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which is nuts, because then if you're Anglican and you're looking for something, which I just met a really interesting Anglican 
a pastor who was like, I, he kind of didn't say this. He's like, I want out, but he, he okay. That's ah. not what he said. It's not what he said, but he is in, he's super fascinating in, in, in the ancient church. And so he's in, there's something, there's an intimation in him. Like I got to move, but mm-hmm. into what Anglican, what would it be like the 1923 prayer book or something? Maybe. I always think you just know. it'll be night it'll be 2022 again before you know it. Like I just don't think Protestantism can offer any of these kinds of things. I'm prejudiced. I'm like a complete pro apostolic church bigot. Uh you know, like it, it, Again, it just goes back to the contrast between the Anglo-Celtic peoples. What what happened to them during this whole transplantation? They all, what what churches did they have? That Anglican, Calvinist, Methodist churches, all of this kind of stuff. Where did it lead them? They had shopping malls. They had no spiritual vitality invigorating that their nations. And yet, you look at the the Mediterranean peoples that were brought down here when we opened up the the borders to. Uh, non-white migration and uh, the non-white Mediterraneans, they brought with them icons, processions, they had their liturgical life. I mean, if you don't have a connection to this, I just don't see how it's possible. This is what some of my friends who, who've become Orthodox in the Ethiopian tradition, this is what they say about the Rastas. The Rastas are right on the edge of adopting fully the ancient Christian personhood they just couldn't do it in some ways they couldn't they were blinded by the whiteness of these bad christic icons and they couldn't go all the way back i find that a really fascinating story about the rastas well uh they are i mean they're part of the afro nationalist crowd that i was hanging around with um and i have an incredible amount of respect for them because the Rastas, uh, Rastafarian people have a very strong sense of the mystical, um, which is possibly why they're resisting uh, involvement with the apostolic church. Because mm. if you, like I have as a vending machine person, look from the outside on the institutional structure of Christianity, you don't get to see very much of the monastic and the mystic. What's presented to you is very much corporate, uh, you know, dogmatic rigidity, but nothing of the heartbeat. Rust is all about the heartbeat. So for them to come into the apostolic church would be very simple if they listen to the emperor of Ethiopia, the last orthodox emperor of Ethiopia, who was Coptic orthodox. He told everybody to be baptized come into the Coptic church, you know, Uh, I think I wrote about this in the article. I forget what I mentioned, but uh, he sent one of the archbishops. He sent the archbishop of the Coptic church to Jamaica specifically to bring the Rasta community into the Coptic church. Um, And, you know, I mean, we have free will, but uh, I don't know how many people have taken up the, the invitation. But Not the, too many, but some. There's mixed. There's yeah. mixed. It's a mixed bag. The, it is a mixed bag. Um, but that was very clear. So, you know, that was a big part of me starting to look back onto orthodoxy as well. You know, when I was talking to a lot of these guys, uh, they really understand the mystical in a way that most people in the West just cannot comprehend. And that's mostly just, you know being part of the machine for too long. Um, But they were invited to the baptism. They were invited to the the marriage supper of the lamb. And, uh, you know, the invitation is still open. They they, they have to come into the church. That's well said. So do you think of orthodoxy as a node of something, let's call it old and traditional? Um, Mm -hmm. And and therefore it has, so here's my ecumenist part of Mm -hmm. me coming out in that way islam functions similar as a node uh buddhism as a node do you think there's a movement in the the vending machine cultures toward these nodes of sort of wisdom and i'm not gonna 
ask you if they're equal. I don't care about that for this conversation, but I, I we can get into that because I don't think that they're equal in the sense that they're, I'm not a, a perennialist, right? But I do wonder if all of them are serving this weird invitational purpose for people searching. Do, do you see it that way in, in Australia or is, am I not getting that right? Look, Australia is really unique uh, in that I think we've perfected materialism here. This country is dangerously material. Uh, the, the, I mean, how many people can I offend with one conversation? <laughs> uh, the, we can look, always talk they, about you guys and the pandemic. That was fun. Oh, oh God. <laughs> um, Look, they call it the lucky country. So the mentality of the, the Australians is that this place is lucky, right? It's just, we live in a casino. This place has just happened. Oh. It, it just happens to be prosperous. It just happens to have never had war. It just, ha you know, it happens to have never had any kind of invasion, pestilence, plague. We just got there by luck. Um, people are very hungry for different things. Uh, you know, supplements to this. I'm sure I think people are uh, clinging on to different nodes. But it's, I mean, it's, it's such a new place. I don't think they've grown out of colonialism yet. I don't oh. think this place has gone past the colonial phase, whereas America has. You've gone into something completely different. You've become an empire. We've never become an empire. You write about that. Um, the American nation lost its, you know, these aren't you words, I'm paraphrasing, something like its soul when it became empire. Yeah, it did. Not unlike Rome. Your history, oh, your analysis is wonderful. When's it losing its soul in that sense? Because I think I might argue it was when Thomas Jefferson said, we need to create a, a country for, for the real entrepreneur, for the real business class, for the business class that no one will listen to, namely me. I feel like he was getting that, that class of, of businessmen, of, of world beaters was just pissed at England that they wouldn't let them participate in the same way because they were on the outside of the uh, uh, of the empire. So I might argue it was always soulless without getting my donors really upset who are American and love our work. <laughs> but I might argue that. Do you think so? Or do you think there was a moment in our history when it got worse and we became empire? Oh, there was definitely a moment in your history when you became empire. I mean, a part of the work that we've been doing, uh, that we've been doing in DCR is, is trying to figure out exactly what it means to be a nation and, a, uh, and an ethnic group. Um, uh, because, of course, we have a Catholic focus, lowercase c, for the lowercase. Orthodox that are listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, very much a Catholic focus. And uh, uh, Professor Brown, Professor Fulton Brown, has talked a lot about the, the tension between England and Spain. So we kind of look at this as the major influence in what happened in America. But, you know, you've got this enormous continental landmass, which is just suddenly full of all of these different people that are running out to form colonies and to gobble up territory. Um, America didn't have to become the maritime empire that it became. It could have been something different, but uh, the, the United States uh abandoned its interior and faced the seas and that's when it became a maritime empire and i think that's when it lost it lost something i mean this is it's it's something i've been arguing with everyone about uh, for a long time is that everyone calls themselves a right wing nationalist and yet they are rooting for empire no one wants to understand the difference once you've moved beyond nation to become an empire by definition You've broken your national borders. You've moved in to eat other nations up. So you no longer have an interior focus. You no longer have a, a you know an internal anchor. You're suddenly like moving out to you know absorb other territories. That is by definition global homo. Whoever is doing it 
it doesn't matter if it's, you know, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, the Romans, you know, Phoenicians, whoever, whoever it is, sure. the British, they've broken national border. The moment you do that, you're absorbing other nations and then you've lost something. And absorbing according to which principle? I think ours was trade. I think ours was trade, yeah. I words, think so. Are we out to make, so. you know, we're out to make Sierra Leonean traders or something like, let's see what you got. Here's what we got. Let's make a deal. I, I feel like that's what happened to, to America after the Civil War. Yeah. Um, but then again, what was the principle even before the Civil War? Something like individual freedom. Well, Americans are so impressive. I mean, if, if I speak to you, you're, you're a completely different set of people to Australians. Uh, oh, how? Hmm. There's an intensity in America that doesn't exist here. Interesting. There is something different about you guys. I'm not saying it's better. <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> different, not better. But no, there is an intensity about Americans that just doesn't exist here. Uh, you seem more... <sighs> more sure of your nation having a telos of having a definite uh, destination. Mm. And, you know, I mean, that goes back to like manifest destiny, maybe. I don't know. But it's just a part of the American spirit. Whenever you meet Americans, they're louder. They know what they want. They tell you what they want. You have some kind of boldness about your energy. But, uh, you know, Australians, we, we tend to just sort of make it up as we go along. You know, that's that's kind of our charm. We don't know what we're doing, but, <laughs> but it'll be fun. <laughs> I know, yeah, but I will say the Americans I know like that about Australians. You, you, you know, you know, you're the moniker you guys have is, oh, they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much fun. And I think it's because you sort of aren't down the road as far as us in your determination to demonstrate that you are somebody because <laughs> that's not very much fun to spend time with people who want to, I'm going to show you that I am somebody. That's not a lot of fun. That's what happens with me in America. I don't like that. It's an ambition maybe is what it's called. I, I always feel like Australians, well, at least this is my impression is nah, it's going to be fine. Everything. <laughs> We're having fun. But what does that do for national identity? Because in the article, what I love is, is, we're also more intense about this whole idea of of um, of uh, critical race theory. We're more intense about the idea of yes. black nationalism. We're more intense about, like, for instance, this whole idea of what a white person is. What the hell is a white person? This isn't on its face. No one should be able to have this conversation with any clarity. Like, if you if someone's clear about it, then you should be scared because what is a white? Person? <laughs> what is that? What is that to you? How many people do you want me to offend in this conversation? <laughs> a lot, because this conversation to me is above all else odd. Black people, white people. I don't know okay. what that is. And your article does address that. So let it rip. Well, my personal way of defining what a white person is, is somebody who's lost a mystic, uh, has lost a monastic. Um, because, I mean, this whole, look, the colonial vision of pushing people aside and saying, okay, we're going to set up a colony now. And then if you're, you know, partially melanated, you're in that particular category. And if you're not as melanated, you're in this category. It's, it's totally, it's, it's an irrelevant. It's a fiction. It's a racial fiction. A lot of people have written about this. Um, the way I define it is that the British were not white. The British were ethnics. They had a race, they had roots, they had territory, they had a uh, language, you know, they had, they had real race. Uh, and then they destroyed their monasticism and they lost it. So people that have uh, damaged their uh, indigenous ethnic mysticism and replaced it with an importation, they would be what I would be considering white. Wow. Guys, um, that's that's so then connect there's something about monasticism and mysticism, obviously. And so a yes, monastic, indigenous, <laughs> indigenous indigenous mysticism. Okay. Mm. Okay. Which is not defined by color. Because I mean, the Irish are indigenous to Ireland. So what so, is when is what is the 
the Celtic monastic doing to retain nationalism or culture, connecting to God in a way that's that's mysterious and therefore um, not universal. Because that's what I think of is that his way of going there or her way of going there is not known to me. Therefore, it can't be mine unless I enter in. Therefore, they have something special that I don't. And mm-hmm. if it's mine and I trust that mystic, then I now have a nation, a nation and I have a group. And you can't have it unless you enter the mystery. Does that sound right to you? Is that why we're it, mysticism and nationalism are connected? I don't know. I'm just thinking. It's complicated. I think I always go back to the example of the early the early church. Um and how they spread the the gospel and how the church spread. And it was always a contest between Christ and r- the regional gods, the pagan gods, you know, the gods of the household. Mm-hmm. Um I think Anyone from like a Roman uh, consul, like Pontius Pilate, to an illiterate, you know, uh, Stone Age nomad, they have the same thing in common, which is that they're, they, they have the same soul. They're created in the image of God. And they have inevitably throughout their life gone through a process of trying to understand the divine. It's just, it's in a different context. So the way, it's a very difficult thing to explain. Yeah. Uh, the, way, the way I would see it is that people are coming into the faith thinking that they're going to put on an external, which is a big temptation. I've gone through that myself when I've gone through my various incarnations of different uh, understanding. I never saw orthodoxy as me putting on someone else's nationality. Like I tell everyone I'm a Copt, but I'm Coptic in my own way. I'm never going to be Egyptian, Eritrean, Ethiopian, I'm, but I'm still a Copt. So the way I see it is the same way that the church would have seen the Goths in Europe. You know, you've got all of these mad Germanic tribesmen running around. They're wild and violent and completely profane. They're barbaric. They don't speak the same tongue as everyone else. But in their minds, they still have the, the spark of the innate yeah. you know, um, creative energy that God gave them. And so what did they do? They brought Gothic into the church. They didn't lose their sense of things. They just had to bring what they already had in and then work it out with Christ. And so I suppose that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. I don't know how else I can make it, uh, sense. make it clear. I mean, like, the, there's so much temptation now with everyone on the internet. You know, they go and they go the, the overdose reading on patristics. They overdose reading on uh, reading a, all of the theological arguments of the church. Well, this is it. Everything about the early saints, everyone's overdosing on existing things, but they're not thinking, hold on a second, I'm doing the same thing that all of these people did. I was a pagan. Now I'm not a pagan. What am I bringing to the, to the life of, of the church? They have something to bring. It's just not. It's not going to be the same thing, obviously, because we were transplanted. So I, I don't know. But it's also not like a really good thesis. <laughs> See, no, it's not that. I know it's really well done. What you just said, you're plugging the mystical part of your your. So for I'll give you an American mysticism. I I really believe this. Please do. <clears throat> I think Americans, and I think the thing you described earlier can be, I hope, can be understood a little bit by what I want to try to say. The American mysticism for me is this profound impresario, entrepreneurial humanity. This, This weird thing that when you meet it, you know it, but you can't define it. And if the minute you try to make a plan out of that entrepreneur's idea, you will destroy his his entrepreneurial idea so there's something about the creativity of a i don't like the word businessman because it's not a business it could be a it could be a set of women trying to start a daycare or something it there's something about their forceful nature and the creativity of that we can do this that america has perfected and that mysticism is something like what we are yes and we should embrace it and we should stop saying that we're 
successful because we have money. But that kind of weird, it's an impossible thing to fully intellectually command, but it should be something we bring into orthodoxy. And orthodoxy should be something like be able to take that in. And obviously, because it's Christ and it's all things can understand it and we can be a part of it as Americans, but we can't yeah. bring certain other things in, sister. There's certain things we cannot bring in. And that is the idea that we can command knowledge. Knowledge is not here. It's not intellectual. So I don't know. I get this mystical idea. That's why I think I like people who can't explain everything and feel a little impotent. (laughs) 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 I don't know if that makes any sense to you. I think about this a lot. Like, what is the American spirit? And it's what happens to me when I come home from working, uh, you know, in our sites. I'm like, wow, there's something cool here. You were kind of describing it to me on some level earlier. You are you are a nation obsessed with breaking frontiers. Yeah. Obsessed. Obsessed. America without frontiers makes no sense. At least, look, I'm not American. I've never been to America. You've got to understand, when That's I analyze America, I wow. do it from the little colony down here, which has become, you know, the 53rd state of the United States, because we have been colonized by America. We're no longer British. That's a different topic. Mm. But culturally, we've been completely Americanized. So I look at it from the perspective of colonial subject of the United States. I, and that's, that's my basis of analysis. No firsthand experience. But you're obsessed with breaking frontiers. Tell America that there is no more border to break and it will lose its mind. Yeah, yeah. But, it's but funny. I think you're, but that's part of the machine problem, right? That's why American in some way is the machine. We have to keep eating and and consuming and and I mean the Romans were the same. They were yeah. hungry, you know. The national animal of Rome was a wolf. Yeah. Like ravenous and insatiable. But there is something very beautiful about that as well, you know. It's like what food is going to satisfy it? That's the problem. It's a nice way of saying it though. Cuz I might have jumped in on that and said yeah, look, we're wolves or we're, you know, we're hawks in the sky trying to pick out all the little the little mice. But in some ways, there is beauty in that, too. Wow. I think there's great beauty in that, of course, because um, it's very masculine. And uh, there's a sense of <sighs> risk, yeah. which I think a lot of the world has lost. Yeah. So, I mean, America's losing it somewhat, but... I appreciate it a lot because it's some, that is something we can share, uh, Australians and Americans. Australians have a good sense of risk. Uh, we don't really factor it in. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't concern us, you know. Can but you. you just, this is. I think people think listening to you and probably me too is that we're growing. We're we're getting closer closer to something like wearing a red hat that says MAGA. But you, you never talk like that in your, in your work. There's some third category, right? And you know, our red and blue disaster over here, right? Yeah. (laughs) I know. You don't end up in a red camp though. It's nuts. Like you're anything but that in your art, in your writing. How do you do that? Well, I can't exist in red. Red would kill me. Yeah. No, red would kill me. I would die. Honestly. Like, I talk to most conservatives, and I feel like dying. Why? It's interesting. Me too. Because they're trying to perpetuate the materialism. They're scared of mysticism. Whereas the leftists are all way, way too much mystical. (laughs) I mean, talk about mysticism. How do you convince someone that there is no such thing as male and female? I mean, this is levels of madness that, you know, you've left the material realm. But uh, I don't like either of them. It's just a bifurcation. You're, you're splitting the cardiovascular system of your nation yes, into yeah. red and blue. Yeah. Why are you doing this? First off, your heart's going to blow out and you won't be able to breathe. So I just, <laughs> I mean, I love, I love the conservatives. I talk to mo- most people that I'm talking to are, are like, they'll call themselves right wing or whatever, but. There is something more. They're not yeah. wrong or right about everything, but there is something more. 
Um, but that's part of the Anglo world, you know. Yes. It's, it, it breaks up the cardiovascular system. This is what the Elizabethans did to the British when they took away the monastic tradition from the British Isles. The British indigenous people were robbed of the fullness of their uh, national life. Yes, that's right. And it's not something that's acknowledged by the colonies. They, they just don't deal with it. They don't want to look at it. I mean… No. I was never taught this in school down here, so I, I used we have to a long teach. way to go. Kilts, I used to teach, and it was a what did you school. teach? I taught history. Oh, really? Yeah, I was involved in a number of schools. We started up a school, and basically, I got to write some curriculum. And one of the curriculum, I did a class called the History of Love, and what it really was was a kind of survey of marriage around the world in time and space and history. And then it got into of course, the nature of love, and then it gets into the mysticism, and you're really onto something. Wherever you find the mystical tradition, Hindu, you know, Sufis on some level, Islam has a little. Mm -hmm. Whenever you find this, though, I like your metaphor, you find in the body a space that can't, that you can't fill with red and blue. So it allows a proper breathing. It allows this space, like, I'm not really sure. I don't know that I'll ever know. Let's keep going. <laughs> and I really <laughs> like that about the mystery. But we took the mist, the, the Elizabethans. What a great thesis in your article, too. That they shattered this world and then perpetrated that shattering on all these other nations on in these boats when they mm -hmm. set out. And now we're living it and it's dying. It's dying. And here's something in your article, Rachel Dolezal. Talk about oh, the yeah. mystical. So oh, in the article, guys, that. I'll I'll just give it two seconds. It's the woman who claims to be black, but she's white, or she's you is tell she us. white? Is because she white? Is John? she white? I know. <laughs> and this is what you said. The children of the pharaohs have anchored their nation in prayer and in patriarchy, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. in physiognomy. Dolezal, the woman who is black or white, we'll talk about it. She you write Dolezal's an iconic picture of the problem America has with its racial categories. Right. These are not nations. They aren't ethnic groups in America. They're cargo labels. <laughs> so yeah. please explain how this woman, how she defies, she's a good test study for us, for identity. Ooh, the crash test dummy of the enlightenment. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, <laughs> the look Dolezal was fantastic everyone was hating on her and I just thought what a wonderful woman okay like let's put fraud aside okay, okay. which is we're great. gonna put the we're gonna put the fraud aside she has black siblings I'm using these terms as Americans use them right now if I if I don't use them if I use them as I use them I'll tell you but look as Americans use them she's got black siblings her parents adopted black children She's grown up in a household where she's having to call those kids brother or sister. That alone, in my mind, what kind of schizophrenia do you have in a civilization where I'm going to call someone who has a different color, my brother and sister, and I'm not going to be the same race as them? Are you daft? This is madness. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Either they're your brother and sister or they're not. And if they are, then what are you going to take from each other? If you can't take their race, I'm sorry. Why are you adopting these kids? Wow. Like, why? Why marry into another? Like, do you know what I mean? Why marry another family? Oh, my God. I ranted about this with someone. Now you got me ranting. But I said, why would I marry someone who's black? Why would I marry an African? and not be able to use all the words that that man can use. If I can't use all the words, and you know the words I'm talking about, if I can't use all the words, am I a wife or a concubine? I didn't sign up for slavery when I went into my relationships in my you know, previous life, right? No one goes into a relationship signing up for slavery. But why is it when you have a mixed race relationship, suddenly you've got someone who can't say the same words as the same person they're having sex with? It doesn't make any sense. You are not uniting. There is no union. This is not marriage. This is slavery. So when I look at when I look at Dolezal, you know, 
I just thought, this is a woman who got it. She really understood it. Her heart is with these people, and everyone else around her is calling them this, and yet she is seen as this, and it makes no sense. It's schizophrenia. Mm. So she's just decided, you know what? I'm out. I'm with them. If my heart is with them, then my race is with them. It should be that simple. I don't see how it's not that simple. <laughs> you say something brilliant. It's always been that. That's the way the Greeks, the Romans, they understood. Yes. They, it's the way they knew it. Mm. It's the way Very they much knew so. race. That's mm. why you could have black emperors. And it's crazy true. And it's also true within African communities in the West Africa that I've lived with when it comes to their skin colors. I mean, you have to realize there's variations there. We don't see them so clearly, but there's variations. But the idea that the variation would set them outside of the race is insane. It's it's actually kind of like you said, it's a type of insanity. Yeah. Wait a minute. What just happened to me? Well, you know, I'm married to a black woman born and raised in uptown in New York City. So she's got dreadlocks. I know this. Yeah. <laughs> and my you know kids. what I'm going to say next. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, get ready in Russia to blurb, bleep this out. <laughs> What, it happened to me. The things you're saying, deep resonance. And I so know the me. words you're talking about. So tell me, you've given your heart to a person. Oh, yeah, 26 years. Yeah. So does 26 years mean that you're different to that person? Oh, you just speak my language. It's impossible yeah. for me to think. It's not, it's not possible. You know what else happens to these dumb racial categories? You know what happens to them. They literally become irrelevant to me. Now, I know they're relevant to everybody else. They're not relevant. You really actually don't know how to, to work with them anymore. I don't know what my brownish, beigeish kids are. There's different colors in our family. There's different shades and hues. What is that to me? It's, it's like, oh, look, my little, my big toe is not as big as your, this is what we're working with. It's that mm. stupid. It's like we all suddenly became categorized by the length of our toes. It's just odd. It's just odd. It's cargo. It's cargo culture. Explain it only that. makes sense if you think about yourself as a piece of cargo, which most people do. Meaning this, we have to fit into, <laughs> we have to be product. Yes. And definable to a system that's not the family system. This is, it's, it's the creation of a, a, like a pseudo ethnicity outside of community and tribe. I see. Because say, for example, you've entered into a tribal environment because that's what you've done as a family. It's tribal. You've got all of the people in your tribe, regardless of their physiognomy, they're your tribe. You understand this. Mm -hmm. Once you move outside of tribal and you go into the machinery of empire, the empire doesn't understand the tribe. They don't care. They just see you as product. So you are then in cargo culture. It's it's just completely anathema. Oops, that's really to like clear. I love how you having look. roots. You look like <laughs> we're not getting it. We're getting it. Okay, good. Well, people here don't get it. I mean, like. Oh, <laughs> um, people here don't get it not yet at least that cargo but, culture is brilliant i have to be <clears throat> i have to be able to define so that i can be properly purchased by the way this is really weird yes yeah. this is also really weird which really falls right in line with how i'm known to corporations online that they don't want to know about my orthodoxy because it's not saleable it doesn't translate well into the into the product world into the cargo world mm. that you talk about Yes. And so that, that identity is always being stripped. It's not the proper barcode. It, it, it can't be yes. categorized. That's so interesting. Yes. Word. Yes. And this is why I think that if people who want roots want to get roots, they need to understand the, the monastic tradition mm. that was abandoned by this system. Because cargo ships don't need monks, you know, if I they just don't, if I they don't need them. Um, but 
but humans do, cultures do, tribes do, you know. So we kind of living in a a two uh, two tiered way at the moment, figuring well, out yeah. like, do we want to become real or do we want to stay in the cargo? Well, like it's it's a difficult conversation to have. Like if you talk about politics to anybody, they're by definition talking about the politics of cargo culture. They have to. They have no way of moving beyond it because in politics you're moving groups of people, demographics. It's all about barcodes and about defining people by these particular sets of characteristics which are as uh, – as you know, broad as you can get yeah. them because you want the numbers, right? It's all about the numbers. Right. But with the faith, we can't talk like this. We, we have to move into something else. But then the story goes, I don't think there's any way out. The story goes mm. as told by our mystics today and, you know, wise, wise elders is that, yeah, you will stand up for that, that thing. Let's just call it the mystical tradition. Mm -hmm. You'll stand up for it and then you will get squashed. There's no way around it. Like that's what martyrdom looks like on some level, right? You, yes. It's coming. It has to. What's happening now? Oh, yeah. It happened in it's your happening country now. with this pandemic, right? People who stood up. You think it's, <laughs> you think it's martyrdom? Well, hold on. Let's be really clear. Mm. There's there's a continuum, there's a continuum called martyrdom, and mm. you're always dying to something at some point. Um, are you giving your life? Not yet, perhaps. But I think you're giving up stuff that's in the cargo, you know, in the cargo culture. Yeah. Yes. You have to. And I, by the way, I just want to say something. I think I'm like you. I rather like parts of cargo culture. I like my drink cold. Like yes. I like air conditioning. This is the tr the trick, right? This is, the, yes. this is the hard part. Well, we talk a lot about uh, being pirates in DCR, mm. which is kind of our, our nice little metaphor for like, how do you operate in cargo culture and retain some distinction? We, we thought pirates was a, was a good metaphor for it. But the church is living in the cargo culture. It always has. It's mm. sprung up in Rome. I mean, we're not going to beat Rome. No one will beat Rome. R Rome was the corporation, the original corporation, the original multinational corporation, and it just gobbled up everything. And uh, the church flourished in it. So we have the, the precedence of what happened with the church in the early days I'm very positive about it. I don't think that we're necessarily going to be slaves to the cargo cult. But uh, I don't know. We have we have a very interesting set of situ uh, an interesting set of challenges to to deal with now because the old world that existed then still had its connection to pagan mysticism, shamanism, all of these kinds of things, people were more comfortable with it. Somehow the Anglosphere has become so bleached and so addicted to science and empiricism that it's scared of anything uh, scared of anything which would be fertile soil for the church to grow in. So it's like we're dealing with a really interesting machine now. It's, it's like the upgrade. There's there, but there's a crazy subculture being born. DCR is part of it. There's a it's really nuts right now because I find it <clears throat> we just opened a restaurant. I find it in the spoken words of people sitting at our restaurant tables. In other words, Tell I'm me. not th this isn't a this isn't just an internet phenomenon with kilts on there and Jonathan Pejo and all these weirdos. <laughs> it's it's in the heart. It's in the hearts of people who are coming to have this this Georgian dinner from the Georgian Republic called the Supra. We call it a cape. Capey means party, mm -hmm. and so I'll I'll lead them through these <clears throat> these toasts in the tradition of Georgia. Now, first of all, you got to wonder why all these. 
people, these Americans are sitting down and doing a Georgian tradition. <clears throat> and if, if you really think about it, it's cultural appropriation, except for it's just called human. Mm -hmm. It's called being human. And when you do it, the, the, the conversations that, that are elicited, the conversations that, that come out of these, of these tables, they're all about this. Now, you're an articulate member of this conversation in a way that you've studied it, but they're all intimating the same thing, which is we got to come, we got to return to something. And I think it's the monastic mysticism, but they don't know intellectually what that is. Yes, it's just a feeling. Which, by the way, is good enough. Just because mm -hmm. I happen to like history and I read about the church and I can articulate something like, I don't know, the third and first ecumenical council. I mean, who cares on some level? That's really not the test for these folks. The, the test yes. is, is what are you going to do now that there was this moment? I call it enlightenment, right? The, the enlightenment is the endarkenment or whatever word you want. That's the problem. <laughs> but when they have this moment, what are you going to do with it? And all we're trying to do is in a restaurant. And the first thing is just say, like, there's more to do. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's cool things. You come to Africa. We'll do this or have another, you know, volunteer at the rest. We're just trying to say now you got to become more than a thinker. You have to become something like a participator. And I think it's yes. cool. But but sister. I don't know. Well, you're doing poesis, right? With your KP. Wow. You're creating poetry with your KP. Oh, come on. And when we have one, to, we'll have one. You'll come. We'll, or we'll come to Australia. <laughs> if you bust me out of jail. <laughs> I'm like, can you get back in if you leave? We got an Australian. I can't. I'm not allowed back in if I leave my own country. I'm not allowed back in right now. What a weird. Anyway. Time. Yeah. But poesis. So, so just to finish. Poesis. I just want to finish and say to you, we have to do po poetry. Yes. We have to. It's not an answer. It's the answer for these times. Yes. And, and I really know this in my heart. The problem is, is, you know, they don't, people don't want it by definition. It's not, they don't want it the same way they want a new car. What, what, mm. Just keep doing poetry. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. I think. Well, Look, we had the we had the COVID thing. I call it the COVID thing because I'm kind of in denial about how horrible it was. But I mean, the whole world's been through an insane amount of trauma. Like two years of lockdowns. We've been prevented from being human beings for two years. Because yeah. they took everything. Everything that makes you human. Physical contact, breath, voice, uh, eye contact with somebody's mouth, you know. Uh, oh, wow, wow. Yeah. holding each other, the smell of other human beings. I mean, I could get into like the sensorial deprivation that the human race has been under for the last two years and the amount of trauma that has happened to all of us. How do you deal with that? How do you work through it? You have to be in the poet poetic in order to undo it. You can't buy a new car. You can't buy a new car your way out of soul destruction. No. It's, it's addiction which is the religion of the West, right? It's yeah. like, buy your way out of this thing and then you'll get out of it. But we can't. It doesn't can't. work. No. I think this is the, the major thing with the, the DCR project is that we are trying to incarnate the entire experience that everyone's going through now in the digital realm, which is very inhuman. There's no breath, there's no touch. You know, it's completely not sensorial. Um, but it has to become human or it's going to eliminate the human. Look, it's the only way I can deal with the world. The whole structure of this machine has been really difficult to process. It's the only way I can deal with it. I have to pick it apart. So the writing maybe feels a little bit wild, I mean, it is wild, but it's because I'm doing it in real time. And it's That's honest. Way I'll... It's honest. Also, guys, if you like history, yeah, it's 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 spot on. That's my favorite part, I think. So we'll find you at DC. It was a DCR.com. What is this thing? How do we go? Is it only on Telegram? Oh, no. So we're on Telegram, DCR. We're on Gab, Dragon Common Room. And we've got our own website, which is dragoncommonroom.com. So you've 
got to go and sign up to like whatever you can find, but follow us because we're about to launch a new project. Uh, we've started working on our third book, Draco Alchemicus, uh, which is going to be launched soon. We're doing an Indiegogo crowdfund for it, uh, and nice. it's very exciting. Um, I'm losing my mind writing this thing, yeah. <laughs> as are the rest of the writers. Yeah, um, but it's going to be amazing. Uh, it's a electric pirate fantasy poem, uh, so yeah. Or Which is right out of this. Company. Making it weird. Yeah. No, but no, that it's all going to fit. I know because your writing is that way. By the way, a little dream of mine is get you, Paul Kings North, who's becoming my buddy, and we all get together somehow and we have uh, the Georgian dinner together, the Supra. Do you have a boat, John? They won't let you back on a plane for real. Oh, I really can't come back. I mean, unless I get the... Oh, uh, well, yeah, don't say it on the recording. No, I can't say it. But yeah, I need a boat. So Who if you've got you? you're anyone, anyone that has a boat, contact DCR. <laughs> we'll end with this. If you have a boat, let's talk. Yeah. All right, awesome. <laughs> Guys, this is Watar. That was Kilts, who writes for Gab and all kinds of things. And you can find her at dragoncommonroom.com. Man, her ideas run deep. She's well-traveled. And a wit I loved talking to her. Thank you, Kelts. Thanks to all of you. This is Watar. This is First Things Foundation. You should come to our restaurant. We hope to see you there. That's KP Restaurant in Greenville, South Carolina. But also, consider supporting what we do. And what do we do? We help local people long term through by creating sustainable income. We do small projects that create hope, but we don't do them. We simply create capacity and send resources toward people who have great ideas in local communities. This is First Things Foundation. This is our podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Nakvam dis. Hasta luego. Au revoir. And what would they say in Australia? Right, goodbye then from Australia. How did it? I don't know that part of the world. So I'll just say, put a bobby on it. No, that's wrong. Uh, Andrew, what do I say? What do Russians living there say, Australians say, when they say goodbye? Goodbye. <laughs>